The advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and I am here with the fabulous Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Good morning. Good morning. I always it's think nice that I can't love you more, but I do. Uh. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. It's so uh, nice to be here. Well, it's nice to be here with you. And I want to thank our audience uh, for sticking with us. We've been on and off a little bit the last couple of weeks. We, we are welcoming one of the most fabulous people on the face of the planet as our, our new content creator and producer for this show, Chris Desmond, who's just been amazing. And we, he has. It's we lovely just, to have him here. Oh, my gosh. So lovely. So thank you, Chris. And if you're watching, it's because Chris is on the job. Um, and, and thank you for finding us in different places than you've ever found us before. And stick with us. We got so much fun stuff coming up. But we're here today with Dr. Grampy Shea. If you don't know her, she's a true expert in the field of autism. She donates this hour every week or as many weeks as she possibly can because sometimes we can't have you. Sometimes we're traveling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're on a plane, we can't, we can't put you in. Uh, but even we've we've had you be in in Saudi Arabia in a hotel and that's true. Like that's any, true. I did a show from there. That's any right. time that she can, she will be with us. But there are some times when we can't. But it's so wonderful because what happens is people get to write in questions from all over the world to ask you questions, and you give them your wonderful support and things that you know. We do like to remind everybody at the start of the show that there is no expert in any field who could give individual specific advice in this format because you don't have eyes on the actual situation, which right. is what it would require to give a responsible answer. So just know she can't do that, but what she can do is talk to you about what questions to ask your experts. She can ask you questions and then give you a general base of knowledge, which we know helps. Yeah, we got a we great have... email yesterday. Oh, that was um, so lovely, yeah. Yeah, we love it when you guys write and check in with us and tell us you know, the advice that Dr. Grand Pichet has given you, what what has happened in the interim. We got a wonderful letter from someone talking about how much progress had happened in the last year because they'd gotten some bad advice about ABA and then they listened to you and I and went, I you know, I think I it's need so to go nice. look at the so research. Nice. Yeah. And then uh, and how much progress their kiddo has made. So we we love that. Uh, we love updates. I've been loving all the updates from parents writing. We have one parent still who's in the trenches working to get that one-on-one -on -one aid, and they have not capitulated yet, and you know who you are. But I think it's coming because everybody else got their aid, and that makes me so happy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that makes awesome. me thrilled. Yeah, very, very good. But anyway, uh, good morning. Uh, we're saying good morning to Andrea. Uh, so uh, good morning to all of you. If you're watching, a couple of things you should know. We're live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, and Twitter. We uh, will podcast later on to all the places that we podcast, wherever you have get podcasts. We're a free download. We hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast. Now, this podcast is its own podcast now. Ask Dr. Doreen is its own entity separate from Autism Live now. You need right now to subscribe to Ask Dr. Doreen, the podcast. Right. Because any minute now, we're going to be shutting it off. Right now, you've enjoyed that if you subscribe to Autism Live, you were getting Autism Live and Ask Dr. Doreen. And it's free either, either way, guys. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe, but you need to subscribe to both because we're, we need to be able to send you the content, and Chris is showing you some of the different places that you can uh, find the podcast, but you need to subscribe so that we can send you um, content. Right. You can ignore the content if you choose to, but we want to be able to send you. We've got some really amazing things coming up uh, and more content that we're creating, so I hope that you will subscribe now as opposed to late. Um, yes, and, uh, thank you so much. Uh, anyway. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you that when you send in a question, and we want you to be sending in questions right now while we're live, if you're watching, we've already, uh, Andrea is watching us on YouTube. I want to hear who's watching on Facebook. Uh, send us questions, be as specific as you possibly can. It also helps if you tell us where in the world um, that you are watching because it mm -hmm. helps us both to know 
resources in that area. Absolutely. I've been amazed sometimes. Somebody will write in and say, oh, I'm in New Zealand and I, I don't know. And you say, oh, call so-and-so. And, yeah. and I'm always yeah, like, look at that. Look I at know that. a lot of people all over the world in right. this field. Yeah. Right. So it helps when we know where. I, I love that Andrea, I, I wasn't going to out you because I didn't know if it was okay, but Andrea is admitting that it's her letter that we got yesterday. Well, Andrea, that made us so happy. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, that uh, was beautiful. Beautiful letter, and uh, it was amazing. There were two things that happened yesterday that just, actually there were like four things really, but I, I got your letter, and then I saw something that Logan Shepard's mom posted that absolutely jazzed me for the rest of the day. It was so cute. Of oh her son gosh. leaving to go to tour Europe and him, you know, dancing in joy and waving to her. <laughs> it, like the best possible circumstance that you could ever be in, your child being <laughs> joyful, walking away from you. It touched my heart so deeply rearranged Very. my what I want to have happen in my life because I always think I don't want him to leave I don't want him to leave yeah. and, and yesterday I let go of that a little bit and said that's I, awesome. I can't wait for him to walk away from me joyfully right, right. And that's huge I'm still emotional about yeah. it but huge 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 um, so amazing and then I also got to meet with some parents last night that were just especially some dads yeah who were yeah. just um, they're they're trying really hard to have the best things in the world happen for their kids, and I was very moved by that. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, I showed you a text about a dad that I'm working with, yes. and it's just, it's really, really difficult. We, we some, you know, men especially put on such a, like, strong oh, look, yes. you know, or face, and we forget how um, fragile they are and how hurt they might be inside or scared or, yes. you know, just worried. D all of the above, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But there was one dad in particular last night who said, uh, I think my wife and I have realized recently that the, the big thing is to learn everything that, the, and he was, you know, referring to the, the people in the center. He was like, we need to learn everything you know, mm -hmm. that that's our best course of action. And I said, oh, you've got the keys to the kingdom now. Yeah. Like that, when yeah. you realize that that's the thing. Um, I remember the early days when, um, you know, I was of the mindset of, here's my kid. Once I realized that you guys were great and that you knew what you were doing, because I had to get through that hoop first, right? Mm -hmm. But once I realized you knew what you were doing, I was like, here's my kid, solve it for mm -hmm. me, what's going on, and I'll come back in when you've solved it. And of course, that wasn't the ticket. Right. I needed to learn. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, you. I, it's and it's not an easy process no. either. I mean, it's a, it's not a quick fix either. It's a, it's a period of time, and it's hard to do all the work that needs to be done. But, you know, we do our best, and a lot of parents do get involved and continue to persist, and it, and it pays off. Yes, absolutely. I'm a little mystified because uh, Andrea wrote in and said, I want my son to be able to go to typical developing preschool next year and ABA. I called the school system and they told me they will su not support putting in the IEP that he needs an RBT from his center. Is this legal? Uh, lots of questions there. Yeah, lots I'm, of nuances. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if they're allowed to prevent you from putting having an RBT with him at school. This is preschool too. That's a whole different thing because you're not even in the school system yet. It's like that starts with kindergarten. So I don't, I'm not sure. This is, I guess, a question for Bonnie. Well, and I've sat with Bonnie for so many of these conversations that I would, I would love to get her words on it too. But what I, what I know is that there is this dicey little thing that an IEP's that they can say to you, we don't have to specify who a provider is, and we don't have to let people into our school. They can take that tack. But I, I will tell you that the opposite is equally true. Many people have gotten an RBT from their center written into their IEP, so there is a way around this. Yeah, and again, I don't, I don't know if this even applies to preschool. Like preschool is a little bit different because I don't think, I, I mean, it depends if this is a preschool that's funded yeah. by the public school system. Exactly. And that's really the question. Yeah. But here's the thing. You have access to me. Email me. Let's get it sorted out. Uh, let's work the steps on it. That's what yeah. I've been doing with a lot of parents about getting an aid in the classroom. Happy to do that. Yeah. As I said, we've had wild amount of success with that. Um, 
uh, there's my email because look at how good Chris is <laughs> on the screen. Shannon at autism-live.com. For those of you who are listening in podcast, you can always get a hold of me there and we can talk it out. And sometimes it takes me a while to get back to you guys. I got a, a, a really long email over the weekend. If that person is watching, I'm, I'm reading it. Hey, we're saying hi to Laurie. Uh, so thrilled that you found us, because uh, I know you were having some issues with that. But you found us. Now you know where we are. Okay. I have to talk a little bit about our topic today, which is help. My child has rigid routines. Oh, right. And it is affecting the whole family. Yeah. Um, that that's, uh, that's our starter topic for today, although we'll entertain questions about anything. But I'm going to jump in with this first question. Uh, which is, please help, my child has a routine that has to be followed before we can leave the house. There are like 14 steps to it, and if you interrupt him, he has to go back to the beginning. It is the cause of so many arguments with my husband and my other children. We can never just leave. It, it is always a dysfunctional nightmare. My husband wants to just pick him up and put him in the car. Routine be damned. We have tried that, but the whole rest of the day is a nightmare. So I always defend the routine and try to get everyone to comply. The rest of the family doesn't agree. Please help. He is 10. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about what routines actually are. And basically, it's, it's really interesting because I remember when I was a student and we used to talk about these routines under the category of self-stimulatory behavior or you know, ritualistic behaviors. And you don't really, it's a, it's a very different point of view when you look at it as just a ritualistic behavior of an individual with autism, as opposed to an obsessive compulsive behavior, which, and if you look at the kind of topography or how they look, they're exactly the same thing. And especially routines, when it's a routine of like specific 14 steps, that is an obsessive compulsive it's a compulsion. Yeah. That's what they are. They're compulsions. And, um, and what causes compulsions um, are very specifically, okay, so in OCD, the obsession, which is the thought, mm -hmm. pre is, is so overwhelming that you do a compulsion in order to calm the obsession, right? So like, for instance, you obsess over the thought that there are germs everywhere. And then the compulsion is to wash your hands repeatedly because it's the only thing that will temporarily calm that obsession, right? Yeah. So with routines, it's, uh, an in, it's something that we are trying to do to reduce an anxiety provoking thought. And it's really hard to know, maybe it's interesting because in this case, the child is doing this whenever you have to leave the house. So it's likely that leaving the house produces some sort of compulsion, uh, some sort of anxiety or, you know, fear or something that he then starts to get worked up about. And then by doing this compulsive type of thing, it gives him a little bit of calm. Yeah. So there are, there are two ways to deal with this. One is literally to do what your husband says, and it'll be difficult for him if not, you know, it'll no, be very horrible. It'll be horrible. Be horrible, but he will, um, he will eventually, what will actually probably happen is that he will develop some other type of compulsive behavior, maybe in the car or outside that will help compensate for that because these compulsions are calming. So, uh, so that's one way. I don't know that I recommend that way, especially because he's 10, which means that he has been doing that for quite a while. Yeah. What I recommend is that you actually see a psychiatrist and try to get some help for the anxiety. And a lot of times the help for the anxiety is in the form of medication. Um, and the medications that help anxiety are the same ones that help depression. They are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now we have all varieties. We have norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, et cetera. But it's basically an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety medication that will help him calm himself a little bit. That, that will just take the edge off. It'll, the obsession will get less in his mind, so then the compulsion, the need for the compulsion gets less. The other thing is obviously, depending on his level of functioning, you can also do 
cognitive behavior therapy, which are like ex exercises that help him uh, um, reduce his own obsessive types of thoughts, uh, exercises that help him reduce his own compulsions. But a lot of that really has to do with how he's processing, how much you can interact with him, how much you can sit down and explain to him what is actually going on, talk to him, does he understand if you can sit with him and um, you know, calm him down in other w w ways and other using other words, right? So I, I really don't know him, so I don't know if that's something you can do um, because basically the, treat, the, the most successful treatments for OCD or obsessive compulsive behaviors are a combination of the two, sort of cognitive behavior therapy as well as um, medication. Now, um, if you are pretty clear, if you ever get to a point where you're pretty clear that the anxiety, you know, anxiety and, and phobia are pretty close, right? Phobia is something that, uh, you know, a severe fear of something and anxiety is kind of an apprehension of something fearful coming. So if you can identify what the anxiety is related to, in other words, is it related to going outside? Maybe there is more sound noise outside. Maybe there's more unpredictable stuff outside. Whatever the anxiety is, the core of it is, is related to. Then you can also work on trying to teach your child how to deal with those things. Let's say a child might have a lot of anxiety about, let's say, going outside than just the sensory input that's outside noise. And if you allow them to use a um, noise canceling headphones, that might reduce the anxiety and then in turn that might reduce the need for the compulsive behavior. So there's all of these types of things. I hope those thoughts are helpful. Also know that compulsive behaviors, even after the anxiety is gone, compulsive behaviors can become habits and you kind of have to uh, gradually reduce them. Yeah. So that's another whole aspect to it. But I, I would really, if it was my child, I would start with a medication because these medications really significantly help the child. They just help the child calm down a little bit, you know. Yeah. And the other thing that I read into it is that um, I hope that this family has the services of an LMFT or something like that <laughs> because... I think it's unrealistic. I, I'm not sure because I've never had a child, you know, that was born and, and developed neurotypically. Um, and I've only ever had the one child. But mm -hmm. I suspect that it's with, with all parenting that it's very hard to be on the same page about parenting every day. Yeah. Like for any parents, yeah. right? But then add in that, you know, your child isn't doing things the way you expected. Mm -hmm. And then you have other people, a committee of people that are saying things as well. I think that that's a lot. And, and I don't see yeah. how, yeah. without help, that it, yeah. it, it, you know, it absolutely can cause rifts between other children and your spouse and whatever. And I think if we just accept that that's hard and maybe you need some support in that area. Yeah, yeah, for Everybody sure. has to agree to go. And that's a whole other Oprah, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But even if, you know, some of you will write and say, I can't get my wife to go or I can't get my husband to go or whatever. But I think if that's the case, even if you go, yeah. so that you have a safe place where you, can, where you can sit with someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight and say, sometimes I'm angry yeah. at my husband or, or my circumstances or whatever. And because I feel like that stuff bottles up yeah. and it's not good. So no, no, I agree. And thank you for kind of talking about that whole side of mm -hmm. it, right? Which is, and this all, this is, it becomes a, a family issue. It definitely does. And you have to also pay attention to the other siblings and what this is doing for them, right? Yeah. That, it, every, that it, it almost starts to become punitive for them to go out. Yeah. Right? So it's like, oh, here we go again. Every time we want to go out, something like this happens. And that will cause all kinds of issues in the whole family dynamic and structure. And so um, it is important to deal with this. One of those things where, because it only happens when you're going out and it's sort of, you can consider it to be harmless mm -hmm. in the sense that it's just a ritual of different things. Yeah. 
um, you, we don't deal with it. We're like, it's not a big deal. Let me pick my battles. Yeah. But it is kind of a big deal in the sense that it interferes with the whole family structure and the whole plans of the family and, and your schedule and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I, I really like the clinician in me is like, please let us know the 14 steps. Yeah. Because depending on what, what they are, you could, you might be able to also shape this backwards and like, you know, kind of have the last step ha happen in the car. So there are ways that you can do this, but honestly, the biggest help is going to be if you, you can deal with the anxiety. It's not so much Amen the that. routine, it's the anxiety that you need to deal with. Amen to that. I want to say a special welcome, because we haven't had you for a little while, to uh, Cameron's, uh, where I've lost it now, um, Cameron's uh, journey, uh, who's with us, because I um, I wanted to say that I saw your post the other day, and I know you got some stuff that you're facing, and I'm just sending you hugs and wanting to know that you've got some support uh, as you go through your recovery. So right. um, sending you that hug and that energy. Uh, I also want to say thank you uh, to Autism Journey with Elijah for reconnecting and posting in all those groups to let them know where that they can watch us. Thank you. Appreciate you more than you could possibly ever know. Um, Did you see so Kylie's I see question? Kylie's now. My, uh, Kylie has written in and said, my child is echoing one word phrases if we verbally prompt and she wants something. How do I increase language from this point? That's a pretty common thing, right? Yeah, it's awesome that she's doing that and that's fabulous. Um, if the first, well, you have to go in two directions. You have to uh, fade out the prompting so that, on, on, this is called manding, right? Manding is when we request things that we want. So if you can start to fade out the prompt so that she uh, will, or he, I don't know why I thought, oh, she, if she um, begins to, so that she can just uh, spontaneously request things. So that's important. And you also are, I think you said phrases, so I want, you know, it's great that she's doing that. The next typical uh, phase of language is what, what we call tacting, and tacting is when you label objects, but not objects that you necessarily want. So, and, and that's a new phrase, and initially it would just be labels, and so, you know, in, in therapy, when we're doing ABA, when we're doing discrete trial or any kind of ABA, the next phase is just to teach the child a whole lot of labels, which obviously your child has some of them. Those are the labels of objects that your child wants, but then there are labels of objects that are just in the environment, right? So I don't know if you have someone who has been actually teaching labels of objects, what we call just object labels, right? So, you know, pen, cup, bottle, etc. And then um, if you, so those are just initially, we would teach them as having the child either point to them, touch them, give them, so in receptive formats. And then obviously uh, the next phase is to ask the child, what is it? And the child would just say the object label, and then gradually that becomes the second phrase, which is, it is a uh, pen, it is cup, it is so on. And those object labels obviously are just, um, that's one category. There's a million different categories because then later on you will teach a variety of adjectives that then are paired with those object labels. So like colors, size, etc. And then those that now forms longer phrases. But right now I think you're going from mending to tacting, which means you need to just have the child identify objects in the environment. And the way you do that is first having touch and then reward each one that's correct. I'm getting into a lot of detail on how to do this great trial now because obviously you will put an, you know, you want to also discriminate and make sure that the child is doing this correctly. But these are steps that are in ABA and this is how you expand language. And I love that you answered that part of the question, but I think part of the question here that we hear a lot of times is that as you're prompting and teaching a child and you say, um, what is it? And, 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 and then you will often say it's a mm -hmm. to lead to cup, but sometimes our kids will repeat the, what is it? Yeah. So, so you say, what is it? And they say, what is it? And how do we get to the, it's a cup? Right. So I think, I'll, I'll that, answer that. Yeah. Okay. But I think, and I think also you're right. I should re go back and read 
what what mom is saying here is that the child is echoing one word phrases that she wants. I see. So, she's so I got echoing, it wrong. Well, I did too. She's echoing the yes. one word phrases, and that's kind of where you have to fade out the. Um, but but you're you're fine right now. Like don't worry about the fact. So what I'm seeing is like let's say, um, child wants juice. And what you do is you hold the juice and you're saying juice, and then the child will say juice, right? So the way that you, I think that's what you're saying. And I think the way that you do this is you start to pr fade yourself out, fade the verbal out so that you'll say like, I want juice, and then the child will start to say juice. So you shape yourself out of the picture. The vocal imitation turns into just a verbal request from yeah. the child. And the same for tacting, for anything else. You fade yourself out. Initially, it's okay to echo, and then over time, you fade yourself out, and that's how we get language. One of the things I was talking about with parents last night is that, um, you know, when, when my son was doing ABA, we didn't have centers, which I wish we'd had centers, right? right, right? right. But we only had it at, at home, and I, you know, because Logan Shepard's mom had introduced me to everything, and she was like, get a nanny cam, get a, you know, a, yep. a, a baby cam, and she was like, and watch everything that yeah. they do. Yeah. Not, not out of a sense of paranoia, but that too. Like yeah. then you have that comfort of knowing right. you're watching and you can see what happens. But I learned so much. Absolutely. And you would watch seven different behavior technicians do something in seven different ways and see that there is, there is like no absolute one way, but that there's ways yeah. and the finesse and the creativity in, in being able to get a child to, you know, to get to the reinforcer, it was a fascinating thing. And I was recommending to parents that, for instance, that they, because everybody's working, right? Yeah. But that they do sessions on the weekend and watch. Yeah, you should watch, um, yeah. Honestly. And watch yeah. so that you learn. Yeah. Because, and if you see three different BTs do it in three different ways and you go, oh, oh, like, I get it. And then you find your particular way. But I can. I would just have a flashback. Always when you're talking about these things, I have a flashback of a of a certain person saying, "I want you know for my son to be able to finish the rest of the word," and yeah. learning so much from that yeah. about oh, I could say the first sound to prompt him, and then I can stop that later yeah. on. Yeah. Finesse, finesse, and, and brilliant. And also just starting. Like the more you have to realize, the more familiar. This is what fluency is, right? Yeah. The more familiar the child is with those specific object labels like juice, water, whatever it is they want, the, the easier it is for them to request those things. Yeah. So it's not always, you know, we ha you have to work on the actual object labels and, and then, then the whole process of requesting, labeling, et cetera, becomes a lot easier. There we go. Stephen has written in and said, hi everyone, my son does ABA speech and OT. Should a child psychologist be a part of our team and what age is appropriate for a child to see a psychologist? My son is six. Yeah. Um, Stephen, so that's a really interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked that of me. So I am a child psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist and I trained in psychology because when I was going to school, it was before the world of ABA even existed. And then, of course... You helped create it. Yeah, we kind of did help create it. Um, but... I don't know that. It depends on your child's issues. I don't really get psychologists involved unless there are other comorbidities that are, um, and, and of course, okay, so let's... Tell us what comor comorbidity, comorbidity means. means, like other issues, like, for instance, depression, anxiety, other disorders that exist, and if the child's level of comprehension is adequate to do any kind of talk therapy. Because ABA is, I guess, it, you know, so ABA's root is that it falls under a psychology, right? It used to be called behavior modification. <clears throat> it's part of learning psychology. Learning is a version of psychology. It's based on behavioral psychology and the theory that um, any behavior that is reinforced is going to increase. Any behavior that is not reinforced is going to decrease through life and that's called operant conditioning it's a form it's a theory that falls under psychology but with our kids they don't have a lot of language when they start and so and most of psychological treatments requires a, a level of comprehension of language 
So for instance, even when a psychologist works with a very, very young child, they'll tell them, for instance, uh, draw a picture of your family. Like that's something that you would do initially to understand a little bit more about what, what's in the child's psyche. That's a lot of language for a child on the spectrum. So if your child doesn't have language, it becomes really important to build the language up first. And that's what ABA will do so that you can kind of enter the cognitive realm of the child so that you can enter their thoughts so that you can understand a little bit more so the child can actually express to you what they're thinking, feeling, what they're afraid of, what hurts, all those types of things. And with, with, with autism, that is often not the case. Often when you're looking at a child who's six, they're not able to express those things. So having a psychologist as part of the team isn't that helpful in the beginning. That said, psychologists can be helpful in assessing. So for instance, in the very beginning, when you get your child's diagnosis, you might want to talk to a psychologist to do a series of standardized tests, assessments. Only psychologists are licensed to do those. And those might be kind of helpful. Like honestly, uh, language testing, um, neurocognitive testing, testing that tells you kind of the areas that your child is very strong, very weak, like their memory is fantastic, but their problem solving is not so good. Those types of things you can get from a psychologist who does testing. It isn't necessary. Um, if you have a plan, I always tell parents because there's just so much on their plate. If your child's doing ABA and is moving forward, then let it be for a little while. Just make sure that you do a lot of ABA because that I want to touch on that over and over again because a lot of times people think like, my child's doing ABA and then it ends up they're doing four hours a week or six yeah. hours a week or 10 hours a week, not enough. And if your child is six years old, this is when you should be doing a lot of ABA so that your child is learning rapidly. Uh, the, the whole concept right now is just teaching your child all the just concrete things that they didn't learn before. And then you go to abstract things that they didn't learn before. And then you can do other things. But right now it's just about teaching, teaching a lot of things. Here we go. I want to acknowledge Kylie wrote in and, and said thank you about the prompting. She said, yes, you got it. We will work on fading the verbal prompt. I like the tip you gave about giving the first sound of a word. We'll try that. Wow. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, thank Andrea you. has written in and said that her son says, call off the lights. Oh. And I correct him and say, turn off the lights. And he corrects it, but then he does it again. He overgeneralizes with everything. Will this always happen? Yeah, I mean, it's like when you learn a new language. That's basically the same thing. Yeah. You will make some mistakes in the beginning. It's not always going to be. Sometimes he'll pick up the exact phrases correctly, and yeah. sometimes he won't. So when you are prompting him, um, just what I would do, I don't know, do we know Andrea's son's age? What I would do though, Andrea, is he's I young. would... He's young. He's not young. young in kindergarten. Yeah. Um, what I would do is... Um, four. Four, yeah. I, what I would do is I would just say, instead of saying, prompting the whole thing when he's incorrect, I would stand in front of it, don't turn off the light, but prompt him with a t so that he starts saying turn off. Like reduce your prompt significantly because a lot of times we just, we think we have to prompt again and again and again and it's because we're over prompting and we're giving away so the child doesn't put any effort into it. He will be very motivated because you won't be turning them off. And as soon as he says the turn off the light, then you can turn them off. Oh. I have to say, I love how our kids uh, assimilate language. And it is just like yeah, learning yeah. a language. Yeah. And, and Jem, when he was little, he would always refer to the dishwasher as the machine that washes dishes. Yeah. And, and I said to him, honey, it's the dishwasher. And he said, to, when he was old enough, he said to me, well, a dishwasher can be a person or a dishwasher oh, can be a see, machine. There you go, there you go. Um, so I'm specifying it's that it's the machine. the machine that's washing the I dishes, love not you. That. And that made my whole head I go love whoop, that whoop, so whoop, much. Whoop, whoop. And he, and I, but he understood when I said the dishwasher, he understood, if I would say put the dish in the dishwasher, he understood and he said, you like to be imprecise with your language. Exactly. Is what he said to me. I like to be more precise. That's so isn't that, good. Isn't that amazing? That's so like, amazing. And the, and and the it's very specific. Call off the lights. 
yeah. is so much more urgent than turn off the lights. Yeah. And so I love that you're like, yeah. he will be motivated because to... Because it's, it's so interesting because we don't realize so much of our language actually is imprecise. Like, mm -hmm. he's absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. He's totally right. You know, in, in some other languages that I speak, there are words that describe three completely different things, yeah. the same word. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we get used to it because we read contextual cues so fast. Yeah. But for our kids who are learning this stuff later, mm -hmm. it's the hardest thing because you have to classify it in multiple ways. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Maggie says, my 10-year-old still has a hard time doing greetings and partings. How can I help him? He only says good morning, hello, or bye when prompted. Um, oh, when prompted. Thank you for your response. So he, does, he has a hard time doing greetings and partings. 10 years old, great. So I love when our kids get a little bit older and they are able to um, maybe read or resp just pay attention to visual cues. Personally, I find it a lot easier to use visual cues. So if your child is able to, I would write the a greeting um, and let me just see how, yeah, so he only says good morning, hello, or bye. When and you're prompted. Try, when prompted, okay, so, and you're just trying to get him to say good morning, hello, or bye without a prompt. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? So one of the things that we do is you go from a verbal prompt to a visual prompt, and then you fade out, and that tends to be easier. So if you can pair your verbal prompt with the visual, so a written word that says hello, and what you're doing is you're showing hello and saying hello to prompt him, and then gradually you will stop saying hello, and you'll have the visual, and then you'll flash it over time, and then you won't even flash it, you'll just bar barely flash it. We had a therapist one time who was a genius at doing this, and it worked, <laughs> and what she had done was she faded it even further, further by eventually getting to a point where it was a blank piece of paper. It oh. didn't even say hello. It was just the action of having a to visual remind. would remind the child wow. of what was on there. Yeah, it was really interesting. Fascinating. So you, it's just a matter of fading the prompt. And I would focus on one at a time, right? So it's very confusing because when we do hello and goodbye and all these different things, you focus at one at a time. I also wonder, Maggie, if he's confusing the hello and goodbye because coming and going aren't clear to him so mm -hmm. maybe you can let us know if my advice was helpful if not elaborate a little bit and we can talk more about it can we talk about skills yeah yeah because in course. skills there's a lesson called salutations yes which is exactly is. this and it talks about all the different, different ways, ways and, to teach yeah. uh, to teach this and um you know skills for autism.com if you're interested in, and in that, go. and there it is, because Chris is amazing. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, autism journey with Elijah. This is an interesting one that I had not heard before. I have a question. For children who have trouble speaking or are nonverbal, is it true that teaching Braille to teach them to talk can help them speak, or is that a myth? I've never heard it. No, I haven't. I have not. Re I might have one child over the years who taught who learned braille but that child didn't become vocal after but the concept of teaching braille is pretty much the same as teaching um, sign language mm -hmm. and or iconic language and all of it in some cases does actually lead to vocalization so I it's possible I don't know if I mean I'm just trying to go through the steps in my head and it is possible because Essentially, you're using a textural type of thing, like Braille, which is texture, like right. feel, and you are now um, pairing that with vocal. If you want to end up with vocal, you always have to, so here's how it works. The other stimulus, so whether it's Braille or sign language or icons, pictures, or so on, has to be a prompt that is paired with vocalization. If you do it on its own, then that becomes the mode of communication. If you pair it with vocalization, and if the child has the ability to vocalize, then it is possible to later on fade out the braille. Also, you know, Shan, this kind of brings me back to the whole concept of, for kids who have a very hard time begin, like expanding their language, 
brings me back to the whole concept of the letterboarding, yeah, right? Yeah, that's the first and, thing I thought of. Yeah, exactly, because these are all alternate va ways of communicating, and I absolutely, I mean, it, what works for a child works for a child, and the yeah. big thing for me is just helping every child communicate. Yeah. How they do it, doesn't matter. Well, and we're learning a lot. In yeah. the last 10 years, what we've learned about, first of all, we've learned that there's how many different, at least different types of autism? Is it 17 or 23 yeah. that yeah. we've learned? Um, and that yeah. each one has different hallmarks with it. Yep. And we're seeing that some kids have apraxia and yes. some kids don't. Absolutely. And then we see that some kids have a motor issue that isn't, I don't think, apraxia that literally is a motor planning issue yes. that um, that those kids with a letter board sometimes are successful and they can't go right to a keyboard. Right. right, um, right. So there are all these different things. I, I happen to know that, um, that in this case, the child does have a visual issue, mm -hmm. that there is a disability there visually. And so maybe Braille would be the ticket. Maybe, maybe, absolutely, um, because now you're depending on feeling, touch. Um, and maybe that would spark yep. more. Yep. I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing. Uh, Maggie wanted us to know um, about the 10-year-old that was having a hard time with greetings and pairings, that the advice was helpful. He does not get confused by hello or goodbye because he is... Uh, because Home he is... Dependent. Yes. So, Maggie, I think you just have to, like, pick one, like, let's say hello, and um, don't like I, you can either try the visual prompt, which you know, holding up something that says hello, and then fade that. Um, but also, uh, just you know, go. We used to do this. Like we'd stand in front of the child and just go like this after a while. Like, aren't you supposed to say something? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then the child like will go through their repertoire and come up with the thing that they most likely will should be saying. And again, use the visual, the uh, pro the fading. So he or go like that, so just to say the first part of it so that the child gets started um, and then fade it to this so that you are waiting for the child and actually keep the child there, you know, until they actually do say hello. This is such an important thing for kids to uh, interrupt what they're doing, look up and actually greet when someone comes in the door is kind of an yeah. important step. Um. Dahlia says, hello, my son is three, and for the last month he starts crying as, so as soon as the therapist shows oh. up for a session. He is receiving 26 hours of ABA per week. There has not been a change in the therapist programs or hours of therapy. What could be the problem? Of a three-hour session, he might work with a therapist for only 30 minutes. Is he receiving a fair ABA? Is it too many hours per week? How is he receiving only 30 minutes? Is that because he's crying the whole time? That's how I read it, but so, tell us. Okay, so that could be that he is, okay. So clearly he's trying to escape the tasks. He's trying to escape doing ABA. So I would try to, first of all, you should be immediately talking to the BCBA who is in charge of the case. Um, and saying this used to be a positive experience, it's not any longer. Usu and this is this goes back to the being fair. Yeah, she says because he's crying. Yeah, yeah. So something's not. It, there's just not enough reward for him in the therapy program for whatever reason. There's a lot of reasons that could be the case, and I'll try to go through some of them. One is the material is too hard. So if the material is too hard. He won't be accessing his rewards because he's not he's failing. So that's one. They would in that case they would need to make it a little bit easier and prompt him more, etc. Second one is he's bored. The material is too easy. So you gotta watch for that. And if that's the case, then we have to be a little bit more interesting and, and offer him um, an opportunity to move forward faster. Third is they're just not reinforcing. Like, so there's just not rewards that are meaningful. That could, on its own, be a multitude of things. For instance, the rewards they're using, could ha he could have satiated. That means he has access to them during the day or he's just not interested in them. Rewards change, right? Like today you might want cookies, tomorrow you couldn't care less, you want to listen to music. Whatever it is, the rewards need to be alternated. In fact, a lot of really, really, really good therapy they should be doing a kind of uh, 
you know, choice type of thing at the very beginning where they will ask the child, what do you want to work for? They'll propose a, a series of rewards and the child can select what they want. Every, every set of trials you do that. You ask the child what they want to work for. So that's very important. You said that the therapists have not changed. So that's good because it gives me the impression that things were positive before and now they're, they've become negative. Perhaps it would be a good idea to observe therapy and see what is going on. Um, is it a reaction to one therapist or it doesn't matter who walks in the door and he will start to tantrum? These are things you need to kind of, if, it, if it's one therapist, then you kind of want to be a little, you know, you want to just test out what's going on with that one therapist. If it doesn't matter and if it's anyone who's about to do therapy, then that tells you that he's just not enjoying the therapy itself. And honestly, it should become more enjoyable. Um, make sure that, like right now what's happening is he tantrums and he uh, gets to avoid the therapy. That is not a good thing. That's not what you want. What they should do right away is instead of tantruming, if he asks for a break, either vocally or just in the case that he wants a break, they should give him a small break. Uh, I would immediately probably chop up the therapy and do shorter ses like segments that are very reinforcing. Whenever things become like this, you kind of reverse the process. So the, the, you know, it, this is how ABA works. You make a demand and then you reward, right? In the very beginning, the demands are very small and the rewards are very big. Over time, you change that so that the demands are lengthier and harder and the rewards are less and less and they're kind of like what the environment allows, right? But in situations like this, you reverse that and you make the demands easier and shorter and the rewards higher again. And then you start to reverse it again. Sometimes our kids just, it, it's just not fair. They're not, they don't feel rewarded enough. And remember, ABA depends on reward. It depends on reinforcement. So if the child's not being reinforced enough, you got to figure out how to reverse that cycle. Uh, I want to acknowledge, and forgive me, I was looking up so that I would have the information, uh, but I could have just asked you. Oh. Um, <laughs> Andrea said, wait, 17 or 23 oh. types of ASD? Where can I read about this information? So the title of the study that I was referring to is Identification and Analysis of Behavioral Phenotypes in Autism Spectrum Disorder via Unsupervised Machine Learning, and your name is on that study. Yeah, so that was one of our studies. And we found 16 phenotypes, but the truth is there are probably more sub-phenotypes. That study was intended to be a first study. Yeah. And the phenotypes are just based on patterns of learning. We, we were only looking, what we did is we looked at patterns of learning uh, based on our data and our skills platform. So like, all, you know, when skills is, a, is, a, our, is the curriculum that we built for CARD many, many years ago. And it... What we measure, it's a, you know, like teaching of a number of different lessons. And what we measure, the outcome of skills is how fast are the kids learning? That's like the most important outcome is, is have we done things in a way that the child's learning? And the pattern that children learn is different. So based on that data, we were able to look at 16 phenotypes. That study was supposed to go into further analysis because you know, phenotypes can be defined on multiple different ways. This was just based on the way they learn. You could have phenotypes. Phenotypes just means subtypes, by the way, guys. So you could have phenotypes based on, you know, response to medication. You could have phenotypes based on uh, comorbid other illnesses. You can have multiple different types of ge genetic uh, phenotypes are called genotypes. Right. So you can basically have different subdivisions. Um, not so important to each of you, but what is important is just knowing that there are different subtypes of autism. Kids well, are different. I think what's important to know is that people like you are looking at the fact that, and you guys were doing this anyway, but now the research was being done and I think will happen again. Pandemic didn't help, let's say that. Yes. Um, but the idea that we could get to the point where somebody could look at your child and, and say, okay, you are in this category, and what we have seen work in yeah, the past is goal, this and right? fast track. Right. And already though, you got to the point where 
One of the things that I learned at one point is that there is a group of kids that, for instance, and I remember this one because I was like, oh, that was my kid. Yeah. That kids who have a visual um, thing going on, that they had a really hard time catching a ball. They took longer to learn how to catch a ball right. than the other kids, and they tended to bump into furniture. They right. had a harder time right. riding bike, harder time learning to read, and one of the things that they learned was, because for us, we said, forget the ball. He's not going to play baseball. Right. Forget the ball. Let's move on to the other things. But what the research showed was that if more time had been spent on catching the ball early, that it was easier for everything after that. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely brilliant. It is. It's, it's really cool when you come up with those types of, like, specific groups that yes. kids can fit into. The problem with autism, honestly, Shannon, is that it's so different and there's so many components to sure. it. So not only are the kids different subtypes, but they have different things going on in their environment, of course. Yes. which then Im impacts them, right? So like, let's say a child of the same exact, like they're, they have sep similar learning patterns. Yes. One of them is exposed to a very enriched environment of learning mm -hmm. and the other one is not. There's just so much going on. One of them is given medication that helps reduce their anxieties, and the other one is not. Yes, absolutely. There's just so much impact on the child and so many variables. But so it makes me hard. sleep better knowing that brilliant people like you oh, are working well, on thank it. thank you. You know what I mean? And I think it gives all of us hope, yes, where we go, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm so glad you guys are working on that in a room that absolutely. I don't know about. Uh, Joanne has joined us late, but we always love it when you make it here. And I owe you an amends. I have a code I have to send you. I've not forgotten you. Uh, and she says, hello from the suburbs. Thank you for all that you guys do. Uh, and thank you for all that you do. Uh, and uh, we're running out of time, but Rocking Autism Journey uh, says, thank you for sharing to Autism Journey with Elijah. Yes, because we're all happy that you were just sharing your face off dur during this, and it really meant so much to us. Uh, Kylie wants to know, if a child has, say, 20 hours of ABA a week, and we are focusing on language and getting the child to speak and behavior, is it worth it adding an hour each week with speech therapist program? Oh, my gosh. Uh, this could take the rest of our lives to talk about. Because, Kylie, yeah. remind me, did you say that your child was three? I'm so the thing is, the Kelly, thing. that um, it just, de it depends. I, um, I don't, so there are sometimes other issues that we're not dealing with within ABA and a speech therapist might be very helpful. For instance, is the child, here's an example, is the child articulating words correctly? If not, then it's, it's actually not a bad idea, <clears throat> excuse me, to add a speech therapist because you're, ABA team will start, will focus on increasing language and the speech person will focus on correct articulation or pronunciation of words. So it really just depends or is the child lacking certain sounds. Speech therapists are, are really good at getting those, uh, you know, the tongue to move in the correct way to produce sounds. But in terms of just adding language, uh, adding speech, I think your ABA team is doing probably is doing an adequate job. But um, at only 20 hours a week. Yeah, and I don't, and, again, and I don't. And they're four and a half. Four and a half, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, if you can increase that, it would be better. <laughs> Let's put it that I way. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I love, hate, I love I hate putting pressure on families because they have so much going on, but the more you can yes. give your child, the better. And I love that as a clinician, you're in that spot. I'm not a clinician, I'm a parent, and so I can say to you guys, do oh my do gosh, Stop saying no to things that you can only get funding right now. Yeah. And you can only get funding at four and a half for all the hours that he needs yep. for ABA and, and speech and, the, and, uh, and everything. It yeah. doesn't hurt. But you can keep on doing an hour of speech when he's eight, like yeah. to clean up diction and things like that. But they're, but, and they'll give you that hour of speech when he's eight. They're not going to give you... 30, 40 well, she, the, hours of... So the child is lacking some sounds, and that's so it's not a bad idea at this point to add the speech as well, because okay. it'll help. But, like, but, I, but I also want you to add more ABA. Yeah, just fill his time. Fill yes. his time. Yes, because I, here's the thing. I think as parents we understand this. Right now, insurance at that age 
should, it, um, if you fight for it, fund you. Now, if you've had two years of ABA and you settled for 20, it's going to be an uphill battle. But if you were walking in the door at four, yeah. your insurance company, if you fight with them, will give you 40 hours of ABA. Correct. Now, ask yourself why. Yeah. Why would the insurance company pay for that? Right. Why do they give that to some people? Because the research is there. Right. So if you and your child is three or four, decide to take less than that, they got away with something. Right. And right. I don't know why we would let them get away with something. Right. That, that's my point to parents. Don't let insurance jip your kid out of something that they will not give you when he's six. They will only give it to you right now. Right. That's my philosophy. Got it. <laughs> it's a good one. Sorry. It's a good one. I hate to think that insurance gets to go, oh, good, I get to take that money back. I know. And the kid didn't I get know. it. I know. Because I the know. parents don't know because we're all so considerate. We know you have so many things to do. No. I think parents need to know this, the, the reason why insurance will pay for it is because that's what the studies showed to be the most effective. Correct. Not because we're trying to feather anybody's nest or the, the, the therapist wants to get paid more. That has nothing to do with anything. The, re, the reason why insurance will pay for it is because that's what's shown to be effective yes absolutely and right. they've lost lawsuits where they didn't give that to families families sued them and absolutely. they had to pay billions of dollars because the research showed that's what was effective that's right that's right i will get off my soapbox no now. no it's really you're good. the expert i just think yeah i mean i think that it is very very important for families to know that every hour matters. It does. And, um, and the, everything you can do to increase the hours of ABA in particular, but also speech, and in some cases OT, just yes. enriched environment. That's kind of what I was yeah, talking do it about. All. Take it all. Take it all. Take it all. Do as, as, as much as you absolutely can. Okay, we are running out of time here, but I, I wanted to stop to say a couple of things. First of all, we got a couple of things that are coming up that are in the hopper. Uh, a really important event. There's a charity, Autism Care Today, that Dr. Grampy Shea founded many years ago. How old is that? Do you have any idea? I think it's about 20 years. I should actually look it up and see. It, we, it might be our 20th year. Oh, my gosh. We should know yeah, that. But yeah. uh, what a wonderful charity um, that gives grants to families for things that families need. Yeah. And, and so when they have an open grant phase, families get to write in, and we will let you know when the next open grant phase is. I think one's coming up. Yep. And you get to write in and say, my child needs an iPad. My yep. child yep. is an eloper, and I need help with safety equipment. Yep. My child is older and needs a computer with this program because he wants to study design, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to afford it because we've been busy doing other things. Right. And the grants are reviewed by a grant committee, and up to $5,000 um, is granted to as many people as can be afforded. So we always want to fundraise so we can yes. afford to give out more grants. So you have the lovely second annual All Ghouls Gala. Do you want to tell them about that? Yes, event? sure. So it is a Halloween event that is um, in the Los Angeles area. In particular, it's in the Woodland Hills Country Club um, in Woodland Hills, California, which is the northern section of LA. And we are very excited about it. So there will be lots and lots of fun things going on at this. Obviously, um, costumes required. It's on the 28th of October coming up. It's our big annual event. And I hope that a lot of you guys will sign up. And who, who, if you know if anyone you're in, in the, the area, area, please come and please the tickets are very affordable, I think. They're $125 each, and we're very much looking forward to selling out. Um, we're getting closer, I think. Yeah. It's that um, we will probably sell out at about 400 people. So There we go. And it is star-studded. Uh, there are oh, yes. awards that are given um, every year. The Lending Your Voice Award, which is given to a person or an entity who has been instrumental in elevating the voices of individuals on the spectrum. That's right. So this year, um, the, the people we're announcing thus far, Dr. Temple Grandin, who will be in attendance. Can't so wait. So if you ever wanted to go to a costume Halloween party with Dr. Temple Grandin, here is your opportunity. It'll be great. Uh, it's going to be off the chain or off the hook. What do we say now? I don't know. I'm so old. Um, Joe Montaigne, the, the wonderful, beautiful, fabulous, soul of a man actor, uh, from things like The Godfather and Searching for Bobby Fischer and Criminal Minds. Um, he is getting an award. And Ariva Martin, who we've had on the show before, who is a, you've seen her on The Doctors. She's a, a lawyer, 
an advocate and a mom and amazing. They are our honorees that we're announcing thus far. So they will be there. Also celebrities who love them will be there. And so if you want to hobnob with those kinds of people and be there with Dr. Grand Pichet, oh. who will be in costume, um, and I will be there in costume, and a lot of the other people. Um, oh, Johnny, that's so nice. Yes. Johnny <laughs> said, uh, we can't at if we can't attend because we live in Pennsylvania, how can we support? That's so lovely. Well, really, there's four ways that you can support. Uh, do you want to talk about that? You want me to talk about that? Please. Um, well, one of the things, if you know a business who wants to support, we are looking for, we have sponsors, um, but we are looking for more sponsors and we're looking for stuff. We uh, have a wonderful uh, swag bag that we give out. And if somebody has something that's little with their branding on that they would like to put in our swag bag, we will entertain that. And they get a um, tax letter for the full value of whatever they give us. We do need 400 of whatever those small items are. Yeah, or close to 400, as many as they yeah, can. that's true. Or if they have something big that yeah. they would like to donate, like I have some things on my wish list of big things that I would like donated because we have one of those auctions um, where it's, silent, it's, yeah. but it's, but it's like a group, it's like a table of items yes. um, that are all branded and we will feature the branding and it's in the same room where Temple Grandin will be. So it's kind of a good like spot to be in, but there'll be five of those tables with different things and people buy raffle tickets and each person puts a raffle ticket, however many raffle tickets they want in whichever thing. And at the end, we will pick one raffle ticket that wins everything on each of those five tables. And we'd like some big voluptuous items, but if they have something that's smaller that they just want to donate one. So that's one way that you can support. Obviously, if you were in the area, we, we do have some spots still for volunteers, but we, uh, we will still take donations to go towards specific grants for the night. And we love it when people share. You should be seeing a lot more stuff in social media today and, and yesterday and in the coming days that if you just share and tell other people about it, that's helping the event as well. And you can also purchase uh, tickets and give them, you know, we can donate them to other people on your behalf. Oh, absolutely. Because there's a about lot that of one. people who want to come and yes. just uh, don't really have the ability to pay for the $125 ticket. Yep. So that's another gift that yes. we'd be happy to give people. And if you do that, just put in the note, um, you know, please give this to another autism parent so that they yeah. can come. A lot of people have done that in the past. We love that. I also want to say that Andrea wrote in when we were talking about the 40-hour things. She said, my son is living proof of this. He is in a 40-hour week program and has been for a year. He is talking and has decreased a lot of his behaviors. Right. So, uh, and that's the whole thing, right? Awesome. In a nutshell. We like progress. We're out of time now. We're past time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Chris, for an amazing show. And uh, w next week, I think we're going to be adding some more shows back. And we definitely, I think we're here with you next week. I might be here next week. Yes, okay, we'll I am see. here. Actually, okay. I am because I fly the next day. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, but reruns for the rest of this week as we get everything back on track. But next week, we'll be back with Autism Live. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.